networking, educating people on these issues. I hope this session will lead to more sessions like this, more multilogues, and more importantly, actions. I now invite Asim. Asim, please take 45 minutes because we really do want to go into depth. And I'm sure people will be happy listening to you for 45 minutes. After 40 minutes, I'll just show my face again so that you know you are nearing the end. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Kamlaji. Good morning, everyone. Namaskar. I'd like to begin by thanking Kamlaji, Meenal, Diti, Sangat, and Vikal Changam for inviting us to voice our ideas here and for putting in all the effort to make a webinar like this possible. Uh, it's become well nigh impossible to speak about a lie which we have been living with for so long, and I refer to development. It is daunting to have to speak of this as well as of what might take its place in a mere 45 minutes, uh, but I'll try. Uh, before we outline the key features of the reigning global paradigm of developmentality, as Ashish and I have referred to in our book, it's necessary to excavate the historical and political origins of the concept of development itself. Where was it created? For what purposes? And for whom? So I'll spend the first half of my talk today presenting a sort of critical history of the idea of development since World War II, contextualizing it in the, uh, in the framework of the war. I will very briefly then uh, have some time to touch upon the history of the idea in independent India and South Asia uh, since the Gandhi, Gandhi Nehru exchange of letters in October 1945. I'll just mention that because we won't have time to enter that correspondence, but it actually holds the secret to uh, what unleashes in what is unleashed in India after 1947. Uh, I analyze developmentality as a terminal cognitive disorder of still colonial societies uh, rooted in industrial modernity itself, whose deep-seated pathology has become only more and more obvious with the passage of the last three generations since the war, since World War II. I will try to give reasons for my belief as to why I feel development as war is a historically more accurate depiction of human reality than development as freedom uh, the way the leading lights of modern economics have understood the phenomena. Taking the latter view, all but condemns the human species to terminal ecocide, I believe, a point understood very clearly by our own seers in India, including Gandhi and Rabindranath. Uh, so in the last part, in the second half of uh, my talk today, I'll speak about Prakritik Swaraj. Prakritik Swaraj refers to uh, Swaraj, which is rooted in nature as the key sort of uh, uh, archetype organizing entity in which human life uh, or rather life is given to humanity. Very different. I would like to emphasize that Swaraj is very different from the so-called developmental democracies of our time. It's a way of life and thought that can help us transcend the ruling juggernaut uh, once it has come to a halt because of wars, pandemics, and ecological catastrophes, the history of the next 20 years. The idea of Prakritik Swaraj is built from the visions of Adivasi India, Gandhi, Rabindranath, and many others. After me, Ashish will be speaking and he will present stories and slides of a large number of practical experiments taking place around India and the world. Many of these are the first blades of grass one might imagine, uh, from a Prakritik Swaraj that beckons to us from the hazy future. Uh, these ideas take on special significance in this Corona conjuncture, when so many millions of abandoned migrant workers have openly declared that they are not walking back to the city they walked away from in the scorching heat of the summer, even if conditions in metropolitan India should improve. In other words, answers to their challenges will have to be found in village, not necessarily agricultural, uh, uh, you know, only agricultural villages, uh, 
uh, and the, the sort of context in which we think about answers and challenges needs to, I think, undergo a spatial uh, imaginative change. Right, I've given a title to my talk, which is from developmentality to Prakritik Swaraj. I see this as a major cognitive shift we have to make. Uh, in Hindi, if I may be permitted a few words, kya uh, din aayenge? is the question we should be asking, uh, you know, every one of ourselves, as well as uh, the, the men in office. I'd like to begin by quoting to you a passage from uh, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru's Glimpses of World History, a book which was written in prison and is made up of letters to his daughter Indira. And here's something which Nehru writes to Indira in 1934. It's a long quotation, so please bear with me. Most of us think of empires like the British in India, and we imagine that if the British were not in actual political control of India, India would be free. But this type of empire is already passing away and giving way to a more advanced and perfected type. This latest kind of empire does not annex even the land. It only annexes the wealth or the wealth producing elements in the country. By doing so, it can exploit the country fully to its own advantage and can largely control it. And at the same time has to shoulder no responsibility for governing and repressing that country. In effect, both the land and the people living there are dominated and largely controlled with the least amount of trouble. It is quite possible that Britain's visible hold over India might go before long, and yet the economic control might remain as an invisible empire. If that happens, it means that the exploitation of India will continue. Economic imperialism is the least troublesome form of domination for the dominating power. It does not give rise to so much resentment as political domination because many people do not notice it. So this is Nehru in 1934. Uh, if we are not to read history with, a, with an eye which is retrospectively biased, it should be quite clear that development is a notion of recent vintage. It first arose in America. Of course, the word itself has existed for long and first emerged from 19th century evolutionary biology. But from the 1940s, it was never applied conceptually. Uh, sorry, but before the 1940s, it was never applied conceptually to describe the needs of poor countries. Importantly, so far as we are aware, most of India's freedom fighters, but especially men like Aurobindo, Premchand, Gandhi, Rabindranath, and many others, never used the term. No matter that Nehru popularized it so actively after becoming prime minister in 1947. Their primary concerns had to do with justice, not economic growth. Wealth was always a means for them, never an end in itself. In Hinswaraj, Gandhiji wrote, I quote, impoverished India can become free. I repeat that, impoverished India can become free, but it will be hard for any India made rich through immorality to regain its freedom, unquote. So as a matter of fact, prophets like Tagore mocked at the idea of progress and warned against imitating the ways of the West. And most certainly the poor of the world did not themselves come up with the concept of development. The word itself just makes a few shy appearances in the Indian constitution. As I will try to show, it was always a top-down colonial idea, not one emerging from the lives, beliefs, and practices of common people. So where was the concept forged? It can be dated to the 1940s when Washington began a reordering of the world to meet the interests of its corporations and the consolidation of imperial state power. It starts appearing frequently in official documents in the US after President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, Winston Churchill, signed the Atlantic Charter in 1941. Now here's some uh, history of the Second World War is very relevant. Uh, so I'm gonna go into it for a few minutes. Uh, in September 1940, you will remember uh, Adolf Hitler, who's arguably the most influential man of the 20th century. Uh, I can talk about that some other day. 
he orders his dreaded uh, Luftwaffe, the Air Force, to begin the strafing and bombing of London and Britain. The devastation of a great country and a great city came to be referred to as the Blitz. It lasted until the summer of 1941. Churchill, in a panic, called for help from across the oceans and asked to meet President Roosevelt. So they meet atop USS Augusta in August 1941. And when you read between the lines of the Atlantic Charter, signed by these two very powerful world leaders, you realize that Roosevelt was unwilling yeah. to enter the war unless it was clear what there was in it for the Americans. Now history answers its mysteries with the passage of time. Intentions held in secret by men in power produce consequences that unfold over the decades and the centuries. Taking a bird's eye view of the whole development experience since World War II, one can't escape the conclusion that the ideology of development was spawned by US policy elites in the 1940s to ensure that after the war was over, American corporations would have a credible pretext to gain access to cheap resources, cheap labor, investment opportunities, and market access across the colonized world, hitherto controlled virtually monopolistically by Europe. Institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, GATT, were created to ensure that Western corporate goals were met. The beauty of the concept of development, premised as it was on economic growth led by private corporations, is that it panders to the aspirations of third world elites and middle classes, even as it caters to the interests of the elites in the rich countries. In doing so, it must structurally neglect the needs of the poor majorities a point clearly brought out by a brilliant chapter in Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth back in 1960. Decolonization began after World War II, and at least officially, and Europe was forced by wars of liberation and independence movements in the colonies to retreat to its own shores in the decades after the war. Continued domination of the country's awakening from colonialism had to be justified by other means. The new emerging world powers were the USSR and the US, though the latter was miles behind, miles ahead by any reckoning. The Atlantic Charter had taken an open stance against European colonialism, affirming the right of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they will live. The Charter expressed the wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them, it also offered nations access on equal terms to the trade and to the raw materials of the world, which are needed for their economic prosperity. Something that sounds quite laughable today after decades of experience with unfair trade and wars over resources. At the same time, President Roosevelt, arguably the greatest American president of the last century, proposed, and this is important, that minor children among the peoples of the world be placed under the trusteeship of the adult nations. I'll repeat that. He said, minor children among the peoples of the world be placed under the trusteeship of the adult nations. So you see how hard it is to unlearn the colonial mentality. Uh, this is 1941. And as I said, Roosevelt is probably the greatest president of the last 100 years. He had apparently inherited the paternalism of his British allies during the war. Small wonder that Washington planners came up with a new moral idea to exercise influence and control in the resource rich countries emerging from European colonialism. And this idea was development. It now becomes clear what really happened on USS Augusta on August 14, 1941, exactly six years before Pakistan won independence from Britain. The imperial baton was passed on from Churchill to Roosevelt. That's what happened. To the leaders themselves, it was already quite clear who was going to be the paramount power in the world at the end of the war. And this is before Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the era of European colonialism reached the beginning of the end by the end of World War II. The hidden imperial motives behind the various defensive ideologies from the Christian mission to the white man's burden, which had supported the colonial enterprise at different points of time in history, were by then abundantly transparent, not only to people in the colonies, but even to the citizens of metropolitan countries. A new idea was needed to continue privileged access and plunder of resources and labor around the world. 
And this is when opportunistic American planners came up with the idea of development. So it was an ideology that was uh, persuasive and it was used to inveigle and integrate large areas of Asia, Africa, Latin America, newly liberated from European dominance into a post-war world economic order founded and designed by Washington. Even a casual perusal of the documents of the era leave little doubt that US planners made very conscious and concerted efforts to ensure that American corporations would be in a position to access the vast resources and investment opportunities of the hitherto colonized world. Now, all this took executive shape and form in President Harry Truman's second inaugural address in 1949. So this is now at the end of that decade and 1949 is the year the Indian constitution also gets written very interestingly. And here's Truman in his speech when he was becoming president for the second time, this is what he says, quote, we must embark on a bold new program for making the benefits of our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. This is the first time in official documents that the term underdeveloped appears, 1949. The old imperialism, this is Truman again, the old imperialism exploitation for foreign profit has no place in our plans. What we envisage is a program of development based on the concept of democratic fair dealing, unquote. So I want you to think about this in the context of the Nehru quote, which I began my talk with, and you can see where the reality might lie. So this official statement came to be referred to in the critical literature, a very small marginal literature in development economics, in the critical literature as point for imperialism, a major plank in Washington's efforts to challenge rising Soviet power during the Cold War. It is noteworthy that we hardly hear of poverty and underdevelopment in the decades preceding World War II, right? Nobody's talking about it very much. After the war, once the World Bank was set up, development arrived in the economics profession as a new field. Funds were allocated to expand economics departments at universities, seminars and conferences were organized, books and papers were published, Nobel prizes were awarded to Gunnar Myrdal, Arthur Lewis, Theodore Schultz, and much later to Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz. These are all prizes for doing pioneering work in development. A good statement of the founding goals of the World Bank can be found in Article 1 of its statutes, a document adopted at the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference in New Hampshire, in those beautiful surroundings in which uh, not so beautiful uh, agreements or rather uh, you know, conventions were adopted. The institution which claims to work today for a world without poverty, if you visit its website, it's uh, embossed on the right top corner, fail to mention the basic needs of people or the need to end poverty across large areas of the world. Instead, its aims, according to the document, was to promote private foreign investment, the growth of international trade and various allied goals. It was not until Robert McNamara demoted from his high office of Secretary of Defense in 1968, after the Tet Offensive wounded American power in Vietnam, was made president of the World Bank that the end poverty agenda became prominent at the bank. So it's not until the 70s really that the World Bank is officially talking about poverty. And by that time, if you remember the Green Revolution and so many other things are, are already underway and in place. So one way to judge the priorities of those who impose development upon the world is to ask what is the exact relationship between economic development conceived in this way and human well-being? So consider a country A, which has built impressive expressways, airports, shopping plazas, luxury homes, chrome and glass offices, but by precipitating ecological havoc within and beyond its borders, and also has a substantial proportion of its population living in poverty, without access to adequate nutrition, clean drinking water, sanitation, affordable health, housing, and education. Now compare it with country B, in which everyone's basic needs as listed above are actually met. Its natural habitats are well preserved, but it has only modest roads, airports, and other infrastructure. All the razzmatazz of modernity is missing, 
but all the basic needs are met, which of these two nations is more developed? If one uses standard measures such as the Human Development Index, it may be ambiguous on the issue. While the second country will have better numbers for education and health, it may not have a high enough per capita income compared to the first country. If one asks experts and common people, they might both answer that the first country is the more developed one, if only because it appears to have a more advanced level of technological progress, development. Uh, and this is the point, the technology, no matter how much human ill-being it may generate, has all along been the primary marker of development. No country is going to be regarded as developed till it adopts the latest on the best and so on. Therefore, by implication, no place can be regarded as developed unless its economy is promoted by multinational corporations for the simple reason that the R&D establishments that generate all these cutting edge technologies are in their hands. The question needs to be asked, however, whether it is more important for everyone's basic needs to be met in a manner which is agreeable to our natural surroundings, is in consistency with our moral and spiritual practices, or for a small minority to enjoy access to the great luxuries that technology enables, even as the earth is ransacked and the majority starves and survives at a poor material standard. The question goes to the heart of the issue of what economic development is. Um, you know, one of my favorite Western philosophers used to be David Hume. And Hume once says uh, in one of his, uh, you know, uh, writings, is statements should not be confused with should statements. So we are not looking at what should be called development necessarily, but what is the actual practice? What is it that the world understands by that word? And contrasting it with our shoulds about what it should be and so on. As we know all too well, the dominant view everywhere nowadays is that overall affluence enables development. And this is best achieved via rapid economic growth in the GDP of a country. It is taken for granted under such a view that poverty will decline over time and ultimately vanish as long as economic growth continues. This way of looking at things is what I call developmentality. And it is this that took root in the world and especially in India, uh, uh, which I know a bit more about than the rest of the world. Uh, it really begins to be seen as our very own religion. After uh, Jawaharlal Nehru becomes uh, Prime Minister of India in 1947, uh, what is interesting in 1945, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, there's an important correspondence in... Uh, in 1945 between Gandhi and Nehru, uh, which was a private correspondence and not revealed to the public till decades later, many decades later, in which Gandhi is arguing with Nehru that look, uh, you know, after independence, we have to adopt the way of Swaraj and Nehru dismisses him completely out of hand uh, and says, what world are you living in Bapu? Uh, the world has changed so much since you wrote that book in 1909, Hind Swaraj is outdated. Uh, the world has moved on and we need to update our ideas and we can't go with this, sorry. So it's a very long, rich discussion, which if there was time I could go into, or if there are questions about it, we can go into it in discussion hour. So I'm gonna skip over all that and move directly to the second half of my talk, which concerns what I call Prakritik Swaraj. And this is a concept which I've been sort of thinking of and working with for at least now four or five years uh, after we wrote Churning the Earth in which Ashish and I described the sort of alternative vision as radical ecological democracy. Uh, I delved deeper into Gandhi and Rabindranath and started looking more closely at Adivasi cultures. And what I understood was that Swaraj is actually untranslatable as democracy. And we do injustice to Swaraj in reducing it to what the world understands by democracy nowadays. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this now. Um, I can only give a light flavor of uh, Prakritik Swaraj. There's a huge amount of uh, things to talk about here. 
Uh, but let's see what we what we can do. So since 19, uh, so, sorry, since 2014, uh, with Modi Shahi at the realm, uh, at the helm, um, development, an idea born in Washington in the 1940s, is the embraced national religion of India, much more so than it was even in uh, Nehru's time. Taken together with such things as the present dispensations liking for laws against sedition, it is safe and necessary to underscore that we are living in the climax of the colonial state. The corona condition has only brought into clear focus the depth of the rot in the system. Here I refer not merely to the system we've had since 1991 or 1947, but since 1857 itself. The 1949 constitution is merely a piece of paper now, despite official democracy. The fundamental political and economic forces guiding those in office were set in motion after the British crown took control of the subcontinent after the revolt of 1857. Language, law and administration today, three major foundational structures of public life remain quite consistent with the arrangements put in place after 1857. The Land Acquisition Act of 1894, for instance, is only one among hundreds of prominent instances one could cite to establish this continuity from 1857. Internal colonialism, as Ashish and I describe it in the book, has now matured under a global dispensation of the digitized dictatorship of what I call more and more biocorpocracy. Biocorpocracy, I'll explain a little later what I mean by that. What lies ahead is, on the one hand, an attempt by the planet's cloud elites to consolidate global biopower. On the other hand, a remorseless process of decay and disintegration is underway with its epicenter right in the heart of the Western world in America itself. This is the history of the next few decades as the ship of global modernity goes down and metropolitan hubris meets its nemesis with Mother Nature herself. We are reaping the harvest of disregarding our prophets. One after another, they had warned us hundreds of hundred years ago of the great perils of, the, of continuing on the modern path of conquest, but nobody listened. So thus it is time to dream afresh. And where do we draw these dreams from? Now, keeping to a typically 19th century European intellectual fashion, Karl Marx wrote that the revolution must draw its poetry from the future. But we know much better than him what the ideology and practice of progress brings. Ask the American Indians, ask our Adivasis, and many others. So we cannot afford the same mistakes that the radical utopians have been making for the past century. Nowadays, we are not supposed to romanticize the past. It is a place you cannot visit, let alone revisit. People were living in the jungles then. They were dying at 30 years of age. We are told pestilence was everywhere. These things may or may not have been uniformly true everywhere, but these are believed widely, including in my profession or my ex-profession of economists. However, considered ecologically, is there any doubt that we have been on the decline throughout the period of the last century of rapid technological progress? A hundred years ago, the earth and the natural world were much bigger places. Technologies were relatively modest. Populations were much smaller. The air was cleaner, the water was cleaner, there was no plastic in the oceans, plastic had not been invented. Our food was cleaner, our bodies while they lived were cleaner too. It was surely not perfect, no world has ever been, there are only gilded ages, no golden ones. But could the revolution draw as much poetry from the past as well? Instead of relying merely on an imagination starved by the exhausting routines of digital modernity. And this brings me to the idea of Prakritik Swaraj, espoused by figures as diverse as Gandhi and Aurobindo, Premchand and Rabindranath, not to ever forget or underestimate the future value of the entire Adivasi way of life, challenging modern cosmologies of time and place in profound ways. Two gaping holes keep drawing in the vast edifice of modern, mostly Western political thought and practice. The first is, that ever since Machiavelli and Hobbes, if not since classical Western antiquity itself, this tradition has grasped the challenges of political thought and practice quite independently and autonomous of the context of the ecological habitat 
and the natural world in which human cultures find themselves living. It is as though the change of seasons, rising temperatures, drying rivers, receding tree lines, species extinction or vanishing resources does not fundamentally alter the problematic of politics in any way. Nature, until recently gender, is quite simply conspicuous by its absence from modern notions of liberty, equality, fraternity. The second great lacuna in the modern tradition of political thought and practice is a deep suspicion of nature, including, of course, of human nature. It begins with Hobbes, Descartes, Bacon, and so on. It is often all but axiomatically assumed by thinkers and practitioners from Charlemagne to Churchill, from Francis Bacon to Sigmund Freud, that nature in general and human nature in particular is not to be trusted, it's to be doubted. That is to recall a moralist of the stature of Immanuel Kant himself, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. Now, that sounds beautiful, but is it true? As an aside, one may note striking exceptions to such a cosmology, often from outside the folds of formal political and philosophical thought. Albert Einstein, for example, remarked famously that God is subtle, but he is not malicious. This is coming out of Western thought too, but what happens to that tradition? And long before Einstein, Thomas Brown wrote that all things are artificial for nature is the art of God. So it all depends on what your cosmology is, what your eschatology is, what your overall worldview is. Can we afford to think any more along the lines of the main currents of modern political thought? Consider a simple but paradigmatic case, the modern idea of liberty. At least since Isaiah Berlin, there appears to be widespread consensus across the spectrum that liberty is a zero sum game. It is subtractive in the precise sense that my gain comes at the expense of your loss. Freedom, in so far as it is seen as coincident with liberty, is thus understood to be subtractive as well. In essence, it is thus understood as no different from power, which is quite obviously a zero-sum phenomenon. Let us consider if this widely, if not universally held view today is actually true. Suppose we went to a farmer's house, tied him up and took over his field after duly locking him up in his homestead. We become powerful, he is powerless. We may imagine ourselves to be free as for instance, powerful nations do in the modern world, but is domination the same thing as freedom? Is either side in truth free now? Would we not worry as to what the farmer might do to us once he breaks free of his bonds? The farmer has lost his physical liberty and we've lost our psychological one. Freedom is lost on all sides precisely because of the central fact of domination. The way to set everyone in the picture free would be to risk liberating the farmer. In this sense, freedom is dangerous. It could cost us our very lives. Should the farmer choose to aggravate his erstwhile loss of liberty with a vengeful deed, for instance, on close inspection, freedom, in contrast to liberty, reveals itself to be a singularly additive phenomenon. My power may come at the expense of your power. My freedom unequivocally does not. One can take this point further and argue that while liberty is the power to expand one's own choices, freedom is the willingness to expand the choices of others, what Gandhi refers to as dharma. And Gandhi was one of the freest men who ever lived because he understood that. Strikingly contrary to dominant ideas about freedom and liberty is our totalitarian post, in our totalitarian post-liberal world today, this last is a point as elusive as it is obvious. Someone who seems to have grasped it with consummate ease is Rabindranath Tagore. In a poorly read series of lectures called Sadhana, Rabindranath writes that just as, quote, the mother reveals herself in the service of her children, so our true freedom is not the freedom from action, but freedom in action, which can only be attained in the work of love." Unquote. Now, how often do we see this all-important matter of freedom directly linked to the service inspired by love? What room is there in modern political thought for it? The cynicism drowns any possibility of love. Democracy surely have nothing to do with love in matters public. One reason among several why it is hazardous to translate Swaraj as democracy. In this connection, it is worth remembering that in Hind Swaraj, Gandhi mothballs parliaments 
as emblems of slavery. This brings us to the spiritual essence of Swaraj. On the face of it, Swaraj is understood in individual terms as sovereignty over oneself. In Hind Swaraj, Gandhi envisages Swaraj as self-rule. Looked at closely, however, both Gandhi and Rabindranath are clear that such self-rule is not crudely reducible to the struggle for national liberation alone that constituted anti-colonial movements like the Indian freedom struggle. Much more than the mere overthrow of imperial power is involved. Self-rule is a political and psychological byproduct of the spiritual practice of selfless service to the community. Gandhi spoke of Sarvode, which refers not to the greatest good of the greatest number, the pet peeve of utilitarians, economists in particular, but to the awakening and well-being of one and all. No one is to be excluded. Remember his talisman. So someone who fails to serve his community thus quietly loses his freedom, no matter that he may feather and nourish his liberties in the bargain giving the lie to the modern liberal conception. In Shadana, Rabindranath repeatedly underscores the fact that freedom is much closer to love than to license, indulgence of the ego, a point that completely escapes modern liberal thought. Rabindranath was the greatest of patriots, but utterly dismissive of the idea of nationalism, thinking of it as an expression of collective egoism, hence contributing to more and more unfreedom both within and outside the country. Just the opposite of selfless service to the community, which indirectly guarantees individual human freedom. Setting aside narrow understanding of Swaraj, popular with many of the freedom fighters of his time, here is what Rabindranath wrote to Charles Andrews, who was equally close to both Gandhi and Tagore. What is Swaraj? Tagore says, it is Maya. It is like a mist that will vanish, leaving no stain on the radiance of the eternal. However, we may delude ourselves with the phrases learned from the West. Swaraj is not our objective. Our fight is a spiritual fight. It is for man. We are to emancipate man from the meshes that he himself has woven around him. These organizations of national egoism. The butterfly will have to be persuaded that the freedom of the sky is of higher value than the shelter of the cocoon. If we can defy the strong, the armed, the wealthy, revealing to the world the power of the immortal spirit, the whole castle of the giant flesh will vanish in the void and then man will find his Swaraj. We, the famished ragamuffins of the East, are to win freedom for all humanity. Notice again that he's correlating a certain amount of poverty with freedom and wealth with more and more unfreedom, right? We, the famished ragamuffins of the East, are to win freedom for all humanity, for we are to make our league with Narayan. Narayan refers to God. And our triumph will not give us anything but victory itself, victory for God's world. I have seen the West. I covet not the unholy feast in which she revels every moment, growing more and more bloated and red and dangerously delirious. Not for us is this mad orgy of midnight with lighted torches, but awakenment in the serene light of the morning. So this is Rabindranath writing to Andrews from New York, if I recall, sometime in the 1920s, uh, utterly disillusioned with the West. Gandhi and Rabindranath are unique in the modern world in having both understood that freedom is at once a spiritual and an ecological potential of humanity, unlike liberty, which is a purely political phenomenon, indulgent in the extreme at times. In this, their thought is to be seen as a universe apart from modern notions of freedom in which nature plays no part whatsoever, except as a helpless bystander in the stormy political dramas of humanity. Rabindranath in particular emphasizes in story after story, book after book, that the proximate presence of the natural world is essential to the realization of the possibility of human freedom. If this fact is set aside, the structural ecological alienation which undergirds global modernity will predictably precipitate conditions which will rob humanity of any freedom worth speaking of. Gandhi's primary objection was less to British rule in India than to the relentless juggernaut of modernity that colonialism had, had ushered in in India. India is being ground down, he wrote in Hind Swaraj, not under the English heel, but under that of modern civilization. It is groaning under the monster's terrible weight, 
there is yet time to escape it, but every day makes it more and more difficult." Unquote. So Gandhi warned about the future possibility of English rule without the Englishman. It would be folly to assume that an Indian Rockefeller would be better than the American Rockefeller. Impoverished India can become free, but it would be hard for any, any India made rich through immorality to regain its freedom. And here is the punchline, money renders a man helpless. Money renders a man helpless, something which should be emblazoned at the top of our parliament probably. Such seemingly counterintuitive wisdom goes entirely contrary to the forces guiding our world today when what one might think of as American rule without the Americans is almost a global norm. It is a restless world in which a bio-corpocracy wears the mask of democracy of which little is left beyond the competing mobs of bullies and psychophants drooling over auctioned offices. Uh, the whole bunch of other things which I would have liked to share with you, uh, aspects of Swaraj, which are very, very different from democracy, but I'm out of time. So I'm going to uh, stop there. I'll leave it to Ashish to elaborate on the uh, practical instances and examples of one might, what one might think of as the green shoots of Prakritik Swaraj. See, the situation today is that if 90% of our workers have declared, let's say, or even three quarters of our workers who have moved back to the villages have declared that they're not returning to the cities. You know, if you walked a thousand kilometers or if you biked 1500 kilometers taking your father behind you, you are not gonna make your way back so easily. So there is a competition now, as far as I can tell, between resurrecting grassroots, localized, regionalized economies and the revival of the metropolitan globalized economy. Whoever gets their act together first will actually manage to hold the workers and that's what is at stake in the next two years. So Ashish is going to elaborate on this from a practical point of view. Thank you for listening so patiently. Thank you very much, Asim. I think we need to listen to all this many times to really internalize it and understand it. And now to take us into alternatives, what is already being done in India but I know in many countries of South Asia, alternatives are being tried. A whole country, Bhutan, has been doing it. So Ashish, you have now 30 minutes to show us the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kamala ji. Uh, like Asim, my gratitude to Sangat for uh, making this opportunity available. And it's wonderful that we're able to do it in association with the Kalp Sangam process. Um, so I, uh, not being as eloquent a speaker as uh, Asim, I'm going to take recourse to slides, but also to be able to show uh, pictures from a number of sites where people are already practicing or trying to practice alternatives to developmentality in the way that Asim has described it but also alternatives to other forms of oppression and unsustainability, which I will very briefly touch upon. So if I might be allowed to uh, share my screen and uh, show you a set of slides. Yes, Ashish ji, I have uh, enabled the sharing. Okay. Are you, uh, are you able to see my slides? Uh, we can see it. It's not full screen. I don't know why this keeps happening. Sorry about that. Just give me a second. <laughs> 
that better? Um, it's the same, same problem. Yeah, it's just it's the same. If you just now, no, uh, it's the same as before. Yeah, it's fine. We actually you can just use this. But you're still not seeing the full. Yeah, but this is good enough. This is really yeah. good enough. Let me just try once, and if it doesn't work, I'll. Do so just, I mean, if you can just try the slideshow option, that might be. This is the slideshow option. Uh, sorry, just sorry about that. Just yeah, that's it. That's it. This is it. Yeah. Oh, it worked. Yeah, it worked. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry about okay. that. Not uh, a problem. If I might get that extra two minutes for technical glitches, for sure, yes. Okay, all right. So uh, I am uh, usually this slideshow, of course, uh, also has a, a longish um, presentation on the problems with development and developmentality. But since Asim has already done a great job on it, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides uh, just to reinforce the point that Asim made that development as we know it today is violence, it's violence against nature, it's violence against communities, it's violence against cultures. And also to add it's violence against each one of us in our own individual identity, our individual spirit and so on. And it's a process that I've also called as uh, uh, the transition from livelihoods, which were essentially not jobs, they were essentially ways of living, ways of being in which culture, occupations, etc., everything was combined to what are now deadlyhoods, where we're killing off huge amounts of the, especially the primary sector livelihoods, but also the new modern livelihoods or jobs that we have are deadening, they're soul deadening, where that's why we desperately wait for weekends and desperately wait for 5 p.m. Uh, and it's this, this transition to what is a certain form of modernity, Western modernity, which is also killing each one of us individually, apart from the cultural and ecological and community damage. And I think what COVID has given us is an opportunity to take either of two paths. And of course, this is a bit black and white. We already see governments moving very much into more authoritarian forms of governance, uh, more state surveillance, et cetera, et cetera, using COVID as, a, as an excuse. But we're also seeing an enormous amount of efforts around the world at recreating or creating new forms of solidarity, looking at alternatives, the fact, as Asim pointed out, that a lot of people do not actually want, a lot of workers have gone back to their villages, don't want necessarily to come back to the cities or industrial zones to work uh, because they don't have any kind of dignity there, as they've realized. Um, the opportunity to actually create these dignified livelihoods where they are. Uh, etc. So uh, I think COVID has given us this opportunity and, and it's really up to us as movements, as civil society organizations, and as some individual sensitive officers in government to see if we can take this opportunity. But when we talk about alternatives, I think it's very important to actually ask ourselves, alternatives to what? Because sometimes we can be very superficial. We can say we're creating a lot of garbage, so let's recycle it. Or there is a lot of carbon emissions and climate crisis taking place, so let's make sure that the Amazon is protected so that the carbon is sequestered and captured. These are very superficial ways of responding to the, to the crisis because they don't let us ask the fundamental questions of what is it that we're up against? What are the structural and fundamental roots of this crisis? And the way I put it uh, in somewhat simple terms is to say uh, that these are, this is a, these are created by concentrations of power, whether it's in the hands of corporations in capitalism, or it's in the hands of states in state dominated regimes, including state socialism, or, and the most, probably the oldest of all, it's in the hands of men in uh, patriarchal and masculinist uh, uh, societies. I noticed some questions emerging about how developmentality itself has roots in uh, masculinity and patriarchy. Absolutely, it does. State domination does, but uh, capitalism does. Uh, and so therefore we have to fundamentally challenge that also. But there are also forms of inequalities and concentration of power in, the, in casteism, in racism, in ethnicism, and possibly the most fundamental, 
in the human domination of the rest of the earth. It's as if human beings think that all of the earth is for ourselves. And so it doesn't matter what happens to other species or what happens to the rest of nature. So if we're talking about alternatives, we have to be able to fundamentally challenge these. And I'm going to move into looking at examples um, where, in fact, people are doing precisely this and then come up again with what a Prakritik Swaraj or a radical ecological democracy could look like overall. First and foremost, I think the movements of resistance, whether they're resistance to a particular project or a dam or a mining project or something like that, or to the structures of uh, capitalism, patriarchy, etc., that I mentioned, is very much part of the alternatives. This particular picture, for instance, one of my favorites is from 35 years back, a movement in central India against uh, two hydroelectricity projects that would have displaced 300 villages and destroyed a lot of forest. They were successful in managing to stop it. What I found very interesting in that movement uh, when I was there was people were saying, when you, that is when the government or, or uh, economists look at the river, they think of it as megawatts and electricity and power. When we look at the river, it's our mother. So it's two completely different civilizational perspectives that clash in these resistance movements, in these protest movements. Another example is from uh, the state of Odisha in southern India, where the uh, Adivasi Rongriya Kon community fought against a proposed mining corporation, also won that victory. And in that, again, they were saying these hills and these forests don't belong to us. They belong to Niyam Raja, that is their deity, their, their god. So if you want permission to mine here, you have to ask him. Uh, it's a very different way of actually thinking about it uh, compared to a modern so-called scientific way where you do environmental impact assessments and then you say, yes, the project should or should not be built without considering these kind of cultural and spiritual values. Now, resistance is one part of it, but we also have to simultaneously think about what are the creative, constructive ways in which people can meet their needs, meet their aspirations without causing the same sorts of ecological and cultural and social problems that uh, developmentality does. And uh, what we've been doing in the last few years is to document hundreds of such examples or receive stories of hundreds of, uh, of such examples from India, but I'm also aware of some from the rest of South Asia, and I hope some of our participants can add more. I'm going to give some examples from other parts of South Asia, but primarily because of my experience being mostly in India, uh, with apologies to everybody else from South Asia in, on this call, I will focus largely on examples from India. So let me move into the examples. For me, one of the most inspiring has been this movement of the last 30 years of about two and a half, three thousand Dalit women farmers and pastoralist women uh, who were in a situation of very abject poverty, uh, deprivation, scarcity of food, lack of access to education, health, and so on, about 30, 35 years back. They mobilized themselves uh, with help from civil society. They, they made themselves into, formed themselves into sanghas, that is women's committees in about 70, 75 villages. They brought back their traditional diversity of seeds, especially millets. Um, they formed collectives, they made grain banks, they created their own local public distribution system for cheap access to healthy grain. They switched completely to organic. And basically what they fought for and achieved in these last three decades is not just food security, that is adequate food in each of the houses, but food sovereignty, which means complete control over the knowledge, the seeds, the earth, the soil, the water, which is required for uh, producing food. Uh, they've gone beyond that in many different ways, creating their own community, media station, uh, radio, filming, etc. What I think is really central to this is the way they look at seeds and earth. It's not just product production systems. They are held as sacred. Uh, so they are prayed to every religious festival. They are Hindus themselves, but every religious festival is, uh, is celebrated, again, bringing seeds and earth and soil into the picture. And to me, that is such a central part of looking at uh, these as alternatives. This is Binodamma. Uh, three or four years back when I visited her farm, it was a drought year, 30% less rainfall. Even despite that, she was growing 40 species and varieties of crops on her three acres of land and producing enough to feed a eight member family, plus able to sell 200,000 rupees worth in the market. Uh, completely dry land, her own seeds, etc. 
Interestingly, uh, these several thousand Dalit women, farmers, originally oppressed as Dalits, oppressed as women, oppressed as small scale farmers, are today not just food self sufficient, but surplus and are able to take part in the COVID relief in their district by providing uh, food grain and providing uh, nourishing millet forage to health workers, uh, municipal workers, etc. From Bangladesh, we are well aware of uh, the Naya Krishi Andolan. Uh, we had a webinar with uh, Parat Mazar and Farid Akhtar uh, uh, last month, where they explained how, uh, again, several thousand farmers, again, led by women mostly, are uh, have switched to organic, biologically diverse farming. Um, and as with the COVID uh, lockdown, they're not suffering uh, the kinds of food insecurities that many other parts of South Asia are facing. Uh, we go to the Himalaya, and I'm aware there are some similar things happening in Nepal, but this is an example from Munsiari uh, in uh, northern Uttarakhand, where Mati is a Sangathan, is a movement, is an organization of uh, uh, women. It originally started with uh, looking at domestic violence as a big issue, and then moving also into economic uh, independence for the women, both through traditional crafts, such as making products out of wool, but also in new forms of uh, occupation and livelihood, such as uh, community tourism. And through that, several households have actually transformed their economic and social status in dramatic ways. Another example, this is from Western India, uh, the uh, uh, revival of uh, handloom crafts, which otherwise all across South Asia crafts are in severe decline because of the way uh, the macroeconomic policies that bear down on them. Um, here, economic, uh, handlooms and organic cotton-based handlooms have revived. And through that, a lot of young people who had moved out into industrial areas or even gone off to the Middle East to get for occupations have come back and are doing or have come back to the handloom weaving sector. What's very interesting is that they say it's not just because of the economic opportunities. It's also because when we are doing these crafts, we are our own boss. We can control our own time. We can express our creativity, uh, whereas when we are a worker in an industry, uh, we are at somebody else's uh, uh, mercy. Uh, and also women, young women are coming into handloom weaving, which they never used to earlier. And they are able to express their creativity, productivity, and are able to have a greater voice in the community. There are hundreds of examples of this kind where rural revitalization in many parts of uh, South Asia, and I know again of Indian examples, has created the opportunity for people not to have to move out uh, because of distress, because of lack of livelihoods, which is in fact the big, big crisis right now with COVID lockdown. Um, but also, in fact, reverse migration in many cases where people who had moved out are actually moving back. There's many, many examples of that. I don't have the time to go into all of these, but we have case studies and examples of these in our website, which I'll point to later. Uh, talking about cities, because obviously it's not just with villages, but we also have to look at how urban life can be revived or regenerated in creative new ways. So this is an example from Bhuj, uh, a, a town in, uh, in Kutch in Western India, where especially working with the poorer colonies, uh, there's been a movement by civil society organizations to implement, mu implement much more self-governance to create the opportunities for dignified housing, for water self-sufficiency. And mind you, this is India's lowest rainfall area. Um, for uh, young women um, to be much more empowered, uh, to create conditions for safety, to create conditions for livelihood security and so on. Uh, so one can do these things even in a city um, if there is uh, that kind of mobilization taking place. Moving now uh, back to Central India and Adivasi indigenous community, uh, what is very important with a couple of examples that I'm giving you now is the demand that when it comes to decision making, and this is referring back to Swaraj in the way that Asim was talking about, self-rule is about being able to take one's own decision for one's community without having the government bearing down or without having corporations bearing down. So this village 30 years back declared that in our, even as we elect the government in Delhi and Mumbai, in our village, we are the government. This is also a village which about seven, eight years back converted all of its private agricultural land into the village common. So the movement against private property is also very much part of this kind of radical alternatives. 
um, a similar but much larger scale experiment is taking place in the same area with 90 villages getting together in a Maha Gram Sabha, uh, firstly to stop mining, but also to move into self-rule, looking at what kind of economic activity they should do, how to protect the forests, uh, and again, how to make sure that women, who even in Adivasi societies, though the, these societies are much more egalitarian than ours outside Adivasis, but even their uh, decision-making is largely male-dominated. So how do the women actually also acquire uh, a powerful voice in the community decision-making? A couple of my colleagues, I think, are on this call, uh, Shushti and Nima, who have studied and worked with this, and they can add more in the discussion. Um, somebody asked about conservation. Unfortunately, in South Asia, as across most of the world, uh, there has the, the model of conservation that has been imposed is uh, very top-down, very exclusive, exclusionary, that people have to be moved out to protect the tiger and so on. Whereas there is in fact an alternative model or series of models available where communities are at the center of decision making. This is with regard to some wetlands in Bangladesh, with community forests in Nepal, with community managed uh, reserves in Pakistan, and many of course in India. Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of data and, and case studies available on these. Um, finally, let me mention two or three other kinds of examples and then I'll move into looking at the uh, Swaraj framework I think one of the biggest problems with the way in which we are uh, dealing with our society is organized right now is that the education system is is fundamentally flawed. It takes children and youth away from nature. It takes children and, and youth away from their own communities. It creates the sense that being competitive, being selfish, being individualistic is the way to go. Whereas in fact, all these examples I'm giving are examples where it's the collective that's important, it's solidarity that's important, it's selflessness that is important, along with, of course, my own individual identity. It's not that I'm going to erase my identity, but this as part of a collective. So there's many, many examples uh, across India and possibly, I'm sure, other parts of South Asia of alternative learning spaces where children are able to inculcate uh, these kind of uh, ethics and values so different from the mainstream. And to remind ourselves, that the origin of the word school is from the Greek word skole, which meant leisure. Now, I don't know too many schools across South Asia where kids have leisure. It's Most of them are like prisons. Uh, similarly with technology, much of our technology has been dominated by institutions of so-called experts or government or corporations, whereas in fact, a lot of technological development across these many thousands of years has happened by ordinary, so-called ordinary people, right? So how do we bring technological development, R&D, et cetera, back into the democratic sphere, back into the public sphere? Again, here are some examples of energy, of housing, and many other kinds of technologies which are actually in, in this public domain and are therefore of benefit to people at large and are also ecologically sensitive and sustainable. The same thing with the media. Uh, fortunately, in most parts of South Asia, we still have a relatively independent media, though increasingly that's being shut down. Uh, in India, we're having all kinds of uh, uh, crackdown by the government on independent media, but it still survives to some extent. And so the movement for alternative media, for making the mainstream media accountable, but also creating alternative media channels is also very much part of this. And again, there are many, many examples that we have uh, from this part of the world. Um, Finally, let me say that uh, when these sorts of movements take place, it's not as if governments are completely insensitive. You will always find the sensitive politician and the sensitive officer and create the spaces to make the policy shifts that would then enable further such movement. Again, I'm sorry, these examples are from India, but in the, nine, in the 2000s, early 2000s, there was a whole series of a spate of legislations that provided much more collective rights or individual rights to people created the opportunities for uh, better employment and so on, um, and also reclaiming one's own control over local natural resources, especially forests. Uh, or there are all kinds of schemes and, and programs which have also been brought in, for instance, for pushing uh, organic farming. Um, so these are the sorts of policy shifts that will also need to take place at larger levels, and that can happen when, we, when people mobilize and show pathways to the government. Let me quickly give examples from other parts of the world. Um, Kamla, how am I doing on time? Uh, you have another almost uh, 
12 minutes you have a lot yeah okay. great so uh, from other parts of the world uh, i mean the kind of examples i'm giving from south asia are mirrored in all over the world there are there are literally thousands of such radical alternatives that are taking place and i'll give you um, oh, by the way i love this map i don't know for those of you who might think it's upside down uh, it's a very decolonial map because the map we are normally used to is a colonized is a colonial one in which europe is on top and england is shown much larger than it actually is uh, so here you can see england disappears um so uh, and this is the actual size of the continents but also to be able to show you many many examples and i'll show you a book at the end where uh, more than 100 such examples have been documented by us so just to quickly describe a few of these uh, i think again one of the most inspiring is the movement of uh, kurdistan of creating an autonomous region within an extremely war torn region uh, in the middle of turkey syria iraq iran etc Uh, where which has been led by women now you can imagine this is an intensely patriarchal society yet the women have actually come forward in tens of thousands to create a eco feminist radical democracy uh, movement and there's there's a lot of literature and material available on this their fundamental philosophy philosophy is what they call genealogy which means the philosophy of uh, uh, gender based or a women feminist uh, uh, feminine based uh, philosophy I recently learned just two days back in a webinar on feminist realities of some amazing other kinds of things that are happening with regard to COVID. In Hawaii, for instance, uh, groups of women have come together to say, "Okay, the kind of economic recovery that should happen in in uh, Hawaii must be based on uh, feminist principles." Similarly, in many parts of the world, we have something called the feminist bailout, which is to say that if we are if governments are bailing. anybody out it should be communities it should be livelihoods it should be based on nature protection and not bailing out big corporations and banks and airline companies and so on which is unfortunately what is happening similarly there's a movement of municipalism in many cities of the world especially in europe uh, where uh, for instance in barcelona where the woman mayor ada kalau has tried to feminize politics which is to say make it much less competitive much more about working together working collectives being much more participatory open transparent more public hearings and so on and so forth and the movement towards what's called fearless cities this came up because a lot of refugees who wanted to have dignified lives in cities in europe were uh, scared they were being persecuted and there is a movement to create fearless zones and fearless cities where in fact they can have a dignified life um many many examples of alternative economies solidarity economy um, non profit cafes uh, alternative currencies time banking which is where people offer to provide free services uh, so that you can reduce the need for monetary exchanges etc etc there's a lot of this kind of stuff also happening let me spend the last 7 uh, 8 minutes trying to synthesize this into uh, taking um, the prakritik swaraj or what we also call radical ecological democracy further and i i should uh, emphasize that none of the examples i'm giving are necessarily perfect they all have issues but they all point us in some directions so radical ecological firstly again going back to the root of words radical does not mean people who kill each other radical actually means going to the root so in fact if we have radicalized youth it be great uh, it doesn't mean muslim youth killing hindu youth or hindu youth killing muslim youth or whatever not at all so radical ecological democracy is a very simple idea eco swaraj or prakritik swaraj is a very simple idea that we are the decision makers where we are whether we are in a village community or an urban neighborhood or in a school or in an institution that's the fundamental unit of democracy and swaraj as asim pointed out but that as we are part of decision making processes we are also sensitive to the needs of other human beings and other species and the rest of nature and so therefore ecology equity sustainability uh, justice are very much part of this the examples i've given you will span at least five spheres of of life um the uh, mahagram sabha and mendha lekha in central india we're talking about radical democracy that where we are is where we are going to be taking decisions and while we make the government accountable the deccan development society dalit women farmers or the naya krishi farmers from bangladesh are saying seeds earth soil water in our control which means economic democracy that everything that is to do with my economy 
uh, has to be also in the control of my own community and not controlled by corporations and governments. None of this will work unless there are also struggles for doing away with patriarchy, masculinity, casteism, and other forms of inequality. So a lot of these movements, they might seem to be an agriculture movement, but they're also a, a gender equality movement. They're also a castelessness movement. Fourth, culture. It's so very, very important that the kind of cultural and language diversity we have in South Asia with hundreds of languages and thousands of different ways of living and being uh, are sustained, are respected, uh, uh, because those are the root of the way of living with the rest of nature and with each other. And finally, of course, the fifth sphere is ecology, because without protecting the earth, we're all dead and doomed in any case. One point I want to make very uh, importantly here, and that we can discuss this more, is that when we look at South Asia, right now we're split into these nation state boundaries, all of which are accidents of history in one way or the other. And if we were to actually do a radical ecological democracy or a Prakritik Swaraj, we would need to start questioning these boundaries. We would need to say that, okay, if we're talking about the governance and the management of the Ganga Basin, it has to encompass all of India and all of Bangladesh together and not have this political boundary in the middle. If we have to look at and govern Indus in a way that's ecologically and culturally sensitive, we have to encompass uh, India, Pakistan, and China together and so on. So you have to actually start thinking of how do you dissolve at least conceptually to start with and then practically on the ground, which means then that the communities that are in these interboundary areas are the ones that have need to have much more say. They are not the communities that ask for these boundaries to be put into place in the first place. Uh, finally, then let me talk about how to me the most fundamental part of all of these radical alternatives are the ethical values. And that's what we need to learn from each other. It's not that we replicate a tech and development society everywhere in South Asia or a Naya Krishi everywhere in South Asia. But how do we learn the basic values, uh, which for instance, I spoke about when I talked about education, that we're talking about solidarity, not competition. We're talking about the commons, not private property. We're talking about diversity and not homogeneity. We're talking about self-reliance and not being dependent on somebody for my basic needs 3000 kilometers away. We're talking about simple living. This is something that Gandhi and others keep, keep talking about, not wanting more and more and more and more at the expense of somebody else. And we're talking about respecting the rest of nature, the rights of nature, the rights of rivers, etc. Which is an interesting new phenomenon, by the way, in India and Bangladesh and the movement in Nepal also. Um, and so it's really worldviews that celebrate life, all of life, not just human, but also the rest of nature. Uh, I'm going to finish now just to say that a question that normally comes up in all these discussions is, okay, you have all these hundreds of wonderful examples, but how do you make the macro change happen? I don't think any of us has full answers to this, but here's a few thoughts. The combination of resistance to the mainstream model of developmentality and patriarchy and so on, along with the creation of alternatives, that, that networking, that combination has to happen across all of South Asia. The movements of the marginalized, along with the movements of whether it's legal action or it's intellectual, so-called intellectual action or writing or media or whatever, have to also combine. And that's actually where, in fact, larger scale change has taken place. We need to look at what are the forms of transition that don't reinforce the current system, like, say, recycling, but actually create the possibilities of fundamentally changing the current system. And we have to be able to collectively envision the future. Let's not be scared of dreaming that future. We did a book some time back uh, called Alternative Futures, in which 35 essays were written about India in 2100, what it could be as a dream future, and then come back down to earth and say, okay, how do we get there? So all of this, I think, is very important. One of the processes we use in, uh, in India, and we're hoping that this could become South Asia wide, is called Vikalp Sangam, which is what all you already described. Meena already talked about it. Alternative confluences of people coming together to do all of this. The same thing is now happening globally. Uh, many different networks trying to weave these different sort of radical alternatives together, learn across cultures, uh, across geographies, um, uh, to be able to create, um, again, a more macro possibility of a more macro change, I'm sorry. And um, finally, let me just show you this book, which we came out with last year, which has more than 100 examples of radical alternatives from around the world, including some that I spoke about. Please do take a look. We will be putting this up soon for free 
download, but right now it's available on sale. I'll end with this quote, which we've used in one of our books. The people often say, okay, this is fantastic, nicely utopian, but it's impossible. And I think it's, it's uh, this uh, Fernando Birri, who's a Argentinian um, film director, uh, quoted by Galeano, one of the most famous author, uh, poets of South America, that utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer, it takes two steps further away. I move another 10 steps, it moves another 10 steps away. So what's the point of utopia? That's precisely it. At least we're moving in a certain direction that we want to move in. Thank you very much. Um, that's my contact details for anybody for further discussion. Kamlaji, Meenal, Diti, thank you again. Um, you have to yes, remove sir. your, yeah. Now friends, I have no desire to thank anybody because we don't own this desire to change. We are all in it together. So instead of thanking the speakers or Meenal and others who have organized it, I would just celebrate our solidarity I will celebrate the fact that there are so many friends of ours from neighboring countries of South Asia present just now. And I really welcome your offer, Ashish, that maybe Vikalp Sangam can now be taken to South Asia. And uh, actually we are already doing that with many groups, but we can sit together now and see how do we do it together? Uh, the things both of you have spoken remind me of a very favorite story of mine, ancient, 2,550 years old. Gautam, the young man, the young boy who went on to become the Buddha, is playing outside in the garden and he sees a white bird fall from the sky. He rushes to the bird, picks up the bird and sees that an arrow has pierced the bird. He takes the arrow out, calls people and they're reviving the bird and the bird is responding when an older cousin of Gotham comes rushing, hey, hey Gotham, what are you doing with my bird? Gotham says, your bird, brother, it fell from the sky. Oh, come on, don't be an idiot. That arrow, that arrow is mine. Yeah, that arrow is mine. Oh, the arrow is yours, bhaiya. That means you wanted to kill the bird. I want the bird to live. So the bird is mine. I feel that developmentality for me is the cousin who cannot live in harmony with nature, who does not love nature, who only sees profit in nature. So mother nature has suddenly become natural resources. All of us are only human resources and our relationships, our friendships are, is social capital. I mean, everything is in the service of greed and profit. And I feel that the only choice is whether we want to be on the side of the cousin or we want to be on the side of Gotham. And Gotham act actually represents the billions of small farmers, small fisher folk, handicrafts people, and people like our migrant workers. They are living the values of what you spoke about. So I feel really more than half the world is living those values. And it is only this kind of networking, we can bring it together. For me, actually, there is no choice. I mean, you can have a choice for another 50 years at the most. 
but there is no choice between the cousin and Gautam. It is only Gautam's way, which you have given as values towards the end of your talk. So I would say, let's continue this discussion. And now I invite Meenal or Diti to take us forward with the questions. And let's see how we move forward. Yeah, okay. So there are not a lot of questions that came in the comment chat box early on. Ashish ji has already addressed them. There are still some uh, left. So I think I'll start with this question from uh, Nepal, uh, which is a question in response to a slide that Ashish ji showed where uh, a community, it was written, we are the government. So the question is, is there any kind of a cap where a self-governing community can work like a limit on the population or geographical area? Yeah, that is the question. So Ashish ji. Thanks, yes. Uh... Well, I think it's very difficult to give a generalized uh, response to that. What we have seen or what communities have seen is that with better governance and management and with self-restraints, and this is again very much uh, the philosophy of Swaraj in many ways, with self-restraints, like how does a community use the forest? How, is it, how does it access the forest? What does it see the forest as? How does it see the forest? How does it see the other life uh, living beings in the forest? You can actually possibly have many more people, but with less impact on the environment. Of course, there would be a limit to that. You can't keep exponentially increasing population also. Um, so uh, these are discussions that don't necessarily happen in all such communities, but they do happen at some point of time saying, okay, if we feel that we are over exploiting the resources or the, or the rest of nature in some way, how do we uh, put a cap? How do we restrain ourselves? What are the sorts of rules and regulations, for instance, that we should have like saying okay no live tree should be cut or this is this part of the forest will not be touched for the next uh, five years uh, there are such rules or customs that are put into place some from very old times some new ones by communities in order to make sure that uh, their consumption patterns and the number of people that are in the settlement are not over exploiting uh, the natural base on which they are dependent so I would say that's the way to look at it, um, rather than in just pure num terms of numbers. Uh, does that respond to the question? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Leslie, who has asked the question, please let us know in the chat box if that completely answers your question. Um, so the next question I would uh, raise is, uh, I will mix two questions. One is from Sejal Dave from India, and the other is from uh, Ritwik Singh. Uh, Sejal has asked if uh, how, that these experiments, they're excellent experiments, but they remain within the CSO's world and the majority keeps ignoring them. And so how do we really mainstream these pil pilots? And the second question that I think is kind of the same is asking if how do we shift the paradigm from self-promoting to selflessness in the current scenario, or is it only possible through educating the new generation? So I, these questions I have mixed because they kind of are asking for alternatives, like how do we really push this into the mainstream? So yeah, either of you yeah, can answer this question. Response and Asim, I'm sure has uh, stuff to add to this. Um, so firstly, I think the notion of the mainstream needs to be challenged uh, because it's a very scary concept. It's it, what we're looking at, what we're talking about is a very wide diversity of solutions that people are coming up with. It's a pluriverse, right? Just the name of the book. That's why we gave it that. When we say mainstream, it's like there's one river that has to be the way everybody has to go. So, however, I think the intent of your, the spirit of your question is how do they go outside? How do you outscale, not upscale, but outscale? How do these uh, hundreds of uh, initiatives actually become thousands or millions, right? That's probably the spirit of the question. And to me, I think there are two or three things that are very important for that. One, much more of storytelling, much more of the ability to actually by the communities themselves, by the uh, local people themselves to tell their story in different ways, in different languages, in different forms, or people like us to help with telling those stories so that others even know that these exist. Most of us don't know these hundreds of examples. Second, networking. The ability to be able to put a number of these groups together and groups that want to do something. For instance, we are now getting a lot of requests from people saying, okay, uh, 
I am now working with this community where uh, 20 people have come back as uh, used to be migrant labor. They've come back. They don't want to move away. They want to stay in the village. What do I do? So we're actually creating, hopefully creating uh, uh, next week, a network called Vikalp Sutra, which is trying to link up the different sorts of movements around. Again, right now, this is in India, but hopefully it can go to South Asia, uh, who are actually creating these livelihood opportunities on the ground to learn from each other, where it's not happening, they can learn from somebody else. So that's the networking that is really, really crucial, where people like us can, can play a very important role. Third, the policy advocacy. Because though I don't, watch, I don't frankly believe in the government or in the state in any fundamental way, nevertheless, we do have a state right now. We do need to make it responsive. We need to push for policy shifts. For instance, instead of 80,000 crores of rupees going into uh, chemical fertilizers, can that subsidy be shifted to organic? You'd then find millions of more farmers shifting to organic, right? So the kind of policy shifts that we are beginning to see in some states, Kerala has some fantastic policy shifts, Andhra Pradesh recently on, on uh, natural farming, etc. Um, uh, Farhad was telling the other day that Bangladesh is at least listening to some of what Nayakrishi is doing in terms of policies. So I think that's the third major shift that needs to take place. And all of this while also continuing to resist the dominant system in order to actually do this outscaling, as I would call it. The self-promotion part of it and selflessness is slightly, slightly different thing because I think that's a cultural shift that is very, very important. When I was young, I remember in school, it used to be shameful to have money. It used to be shameful not to use my pencil all the way down to it was this much. Today it's the reverse. If I was to use a pencil of this size as a student, I would be laughed at, right? It's a cultural shift towards immense amounts of consumerism and so on and, and individuality and selfishness that has happened. There's no reason why we cannot make the cultural shift away again towards more collective ways of doing things. It's happening right now with the COVID crisis. It's happening with people going out of the way to express solidarity, going out of their way to help elderly people to get the medicines that they need because they can't go out of their houses right now. I think that's the kind of spirit that could come back and that requires a mind shift, a cultural shift in order to put, uh, to move away from selfishness towards much more collective and selfless kind of action. Thanks. Asim. All right. uh, Asimji, do you want to add something to that? Well, I mean, I'll let me answer the two questions uh, in an interrelated way. Um, see, what has made all our problems so vexing and complicated is the sheer speed and scale of what is described as the mainstream, right? Uh, this corona pause is actually the first time uh, in any of our living memories when the global system has ground to a halt uh, virtually. Uh, the sheer scale and speed is generated by very, very powerful technologies. And before you know it, you get sucked into it as into a vortex. Uh, and that vortex has uh, no center except uh, in some abstract digital sphere, which is why I keep referring to the cloud elites because they're in control of that center uh, wherever they have billions of dollars to fund the, the, the enterprises. So uh, now if you are asking, how do you generalize from these small islands of uh, you know, ecological or cultural success, uh, how do you make this more general? Uh, there is no way till you challenge the policy framework of the mainstream. There's a particular policy framework in place which is generating macro outcomes. It is influencing micro outcomes the pressure of it is enormous globally, not just in India, and especially for the past, past 30 years since, since official communism ended, because till official communism was there, there was an attempt on the part of Western democracies to perform on social indicators in comparison with communism. Once that countervailing pressure disappeared, perverse as it might have been, uh, all bets were off and you had a unipolar world for the longest time and the American dream got globalized. Now, uh, if you want to therefore think of changing the mainstream or shifting the discourse and shifting policy making and decision making and so on, 
you have to do a lot of work both at the grassroots practical level as well as at the ideational and intellectual level. So for instance, right now in the COVID conjuncture, what I feel is necessary is that grassroots initiatives, especially in rural areas, but not only in rural areas, need to actually become very alert to every possibility of shifting uh, policy from the ground up. That is to say, what are the sort of demands that can be made at the district level, at the state level? Because the center is not responding. The center is only interested in imposing. The only way the center will change its stance is if the pressure comes from below. Now, state governments in many cases are responsive to it, whether it's in Kerala or parts of Odisha or uh, you know, Sikkim or somewhere else. Uh, so can those initiatives be mobilized? So that is one important thing. The imagination has to change. You see, people keep giving arguments about how agriculture is not the answer. And it's true that agriculture is only part of the answer. It's not the only answer. However, there is a whole bunch of other things that need to surround agriculture in the countryside, which you know, consist of uh, small and medium-sized industries, which are actually sustainable with renewable energy and so on. The only problem is they're too small scale and they move at a very different pace and they're not interested in competing globally. And so policy attention doesn't go there. There are 800 arts and crafts in the listings of the government of India, which are not called industry. But if you go to Thailand or if you go to Indonesia or South Korea, you find that these are cultures which have managed to protect the continuation of their traditional handicraft, upgraded skills, enabled marketing, enabled you know, credit from the government side and so on in order to create a sustainable livelihood for millions of people actually. If you go to Bangkok, there is a bazaar called Chatuchak. Some of you might have been there, which has a $3 billion annual turnover. It is the great grandmother of Dilli Hart. So that is a workable idea, except that for our politicians, there's not much in the, in the kitty for them. So unless the pressure comes from somewhere and the imagination from the grassroots changes, no change is going to come from the top. So uh, uh, the, the other question about selflessness and uh, selfishness is a, is a very deep one. I don't know the answer to it. I'll only say this. Nobody talks about media in a critical way in this country. Everything is on as far as the media is concerned. Now, the time is long past when parents and elders and teachers used to bring up children. Now it's the marketing divisions of you know, Microsoft and Google and Apple who are bringing up children. And there is no hold on them. There is absolutely no critical scrutiny in a serious way. And unless we challenge the values that are being inculcated with video gaming and you know, massive amounts of uh, sexualization of content and so on, I don't think there is any simple way to get out of this moral crisis or cognitive crisis when it comes to you know, selflessness and so on. Okay, uh, thank you for this answers. Uh, I think the next question would be, uh, it was a very early question and uh, somebody had asked that how do you visualize the rule of law currently, like in our current context, law is very centralized, more centralized than before. And how do you visualize the rule of law in your alternatives that you are imagining? Um, any of you can answer that question. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I said, do you want to go first? You go ahead. So I lived four years in Norway and uh, something interesting happened there, which was that uh, there was a hydroelectric project in the north of Norway, which was vetoed out by the local communa, despite the fact that the parliament in Oslo had passed it and everybody else in Norway seemed to want it. The analogy for us in India or uh, several parts of the world uh, would be the following. In India, you have a three-tier system of government. Okay, there's the center, there's the state, and there's local government. Local government has zero legislative power, right? It has no power to make laws of any sort. And uh, it, 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 uh, it basically accedes to whatever the state government or the central government, depending on whether something is a state subject or a central subject, has determined to be uh, the, the way things are going to be done. So 
the tier three does not have any veto power over any project which affects their livelihoods and communities locally in an adverse manner. Okay, you have Johnson Wise, but more and more they are not happening. And especially in this lockdown period, I don't know how many people are aware, but in the last one month itself, the government has issued 30 clearances for forests to be simply removed. 30 forests are going to be eliminated uh, purely by decision by diktat in Paryavaran Bhavan in Delhi without anything beyond an online consultation. So on-site visits, none of that has happened. So this is the exact reversal of what needs to happen. This is what you would call uh, Vinash Kala Vipreet Buddhi, uh, the exact opposite of what you need to do. So the entire legislative structure has become more and more desperate to actually invite investment. And yet investment is not coming. We're bending over backwards to please every investor in the world. It's not a world of consumer sovereignty. It's a world of investor sovereignty. It's been like that for 20, 30 years. And uh, in this sort of world, laws are obviously going to be written to favor them, and yet they are not responding. And meanwhile, the kind of legislation you need in order to defend the rights of the poor or the rights of nature are you know, less and less frequent uh, uh, in their applicability, if not in their very creation. So this needs to be challenged fundamentally. And I think the COVID crisis is a good place to start doing that. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to this is, uh, I mean, law is made by the dominant system. And uh, just because it's law doesn't mean that it's ethically correct. This is something that Gandhi taught us very well in the independence struggle uh, as a lawyer, interestingly. Uh, but And also that we have got uh, that statutory law, which is sort of the Western rational way of, uh, of dealing with law, has kind of dominated what communities do with customary law. And I think we need to figure out how customary law, like I mentioned the fact that all these communities that are protecting natural ecosystems have their own rules and norms and so on. That's customary law, right? Uh, this doesn't mean that all customary law also is good. I mean, a lot of customary law can also be gender insensitive, casteism, et cetera, is built into it. But it's this combination of trying to figure out how, uh, and that's where the third tier that Kasim is talking about, how gram sabhas or urban neighborhoods could also be their own lawmaking or norm making institutions, even as the statutory law. So what is the relationship between the two? And therefore then the rule of law becomes a much more sophisticated, much more nuanced way of looking at it rather than simply saying, okay, here's a law and let's uh, uh, implement it or let's make sure that everything is happening by the rule of that law. Okay, thank you both. Um... I think uh, the next question I will ask uh, a lot of people, I mean, uh, one person asked it, but a lot of people have supported plus one it. So uh, clearly a lot of people want answers to this question. It's not really a question. Um, this is to Asim Ji uh, and uh, his presentation. And uh, the suggestion is to reflect upon how development developmentality has its deep roots in patriarchy and masculinity, which I'm also combining with another question which asked, what are some of the non-male thoughts, practices, and voices that may have tried to influence the development, this development uh, through the, or the de ideas, development of ideas around development? So some of these uh, gaps they have been, they are asking to fill. Now I realize that this will take a lot of time. So if, if possible, a succinct response. Asim. One minute of three minutes. <laughs> I mean, five minutes. Okay. So, well, let's look at the roots of the phenomena and uh, go back five centuries and ask yourself, who are the founders of what one might call cognitive modernity? That is to say, who are the leading lights who actually shape and represent the thinking of uh, Western humanity in the 16th century? You know, after you have Columbus and Vasco doing their voyages, uh, which sort of inaugurates the colonial era, uh, the entire adventure of colonialism, right from the very start, has been a masculinist enterprise. Conquest, 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 all the way to the present. So war is therefore the defining reality, not just the metaphor for modernity. Okay, Anybody who doesn't understand that needs to read some history. 
I think it's very clear that throughout these five centuries, war has been the mainstay. The 19th century, for instance, was a very peaceful century, they say, in Europe. It was a century of progress and so on. It just so turns out that in India, the British Empire carried out 111 wars in 100 years in this so-called peaceful century. So the Cold War, for instance, was very cold between uh, the US and the Soviet Union, but it was damn hot for most of the third world, whether you look at Angola or Mozambique or Cuba or parts of Latin America or Southeast Asia. So the proxy wars were fought there. Now, why am I going on about this? Only to show that conquest and war have been from the very beginning, the defining motifs of modernity. Okay. There is no capitalist modernity without war. It's an ongoing project of capital. Destroy and recreate, destroy and reconstruct. In the process of destruction, you build a whole series of industries from the military hardware side. In the process of reconstructing, you again create business for reconstruction companies, infrastructure companies, water companies, etc. This is called creative destruction. Now, this has been going on. And none of this has anything to do with women. None of this has anything to do with nature, except for they, them to suffer the collateral damage of this long project of war. Okay. So uh, the only qualifier I will make here is to distinguish between patriarchy and masculinism. For me, the distinction is quite deep. I can't go into it here. There is no time. It will require a different discussion on what I call the ecosophy of gender get into it. But if you just look at the thinking that has shaped so much of the practice of modern science and technology and business, right from the beginning, you take Francis Bacon, he talks about the masculine birth of time, he talks about the effecting of all things possible, he talks about storming the citadels of nature, and building the human empire, all this, I'm just quoting verbatim from Francis Bacon. It's very much part of the practice of applied science around the world to this day. So uh, unless we are willing to question all this cognitively and ethically, we are not going to be able to see through the elaborateness of the ruses under which you know, the whole system functions today. And writ into it, into the very heart of it, is an expansionist, comparative, aggressive agenda towards nature and most of Earth-based humanity, because they want to take the flight to Moon and Mars. Uh, President Trump issued a, an executive order on the 6th of April saying that the mining of the moon uh, must now begin commercially, and America is going to exercise its rights over it. It has signed no moon agreement with the rest of the world. And so America is going to get into these uh, adventures, getting resources from the moon. So it's as crazy as that. And this imagination has captured the imagination of so many young people nowadays. The, the idea of the space fantasy, interstellar and so on. The protagonist of Interstellar, if you see that film says, we were not born to be caretakers. We were born to be adventurers and explorers. Now, where is all this coming from? It's coming from a long legacy of conquest which has shaped modern consciousness. So all that needs to be examined now. <clears throat> would you like to add to that or no you're on mute sorry no i was just saying no i, I think asim has done that, uh, uh, has done that very well. okay so then i guess we'll just take the last two questions there's one question on uh, alternative media can alternative media help generate a sense of bioregionalism among people of a bioregion of course, we can't afford to fall into the trap of replacing nation state rivalries with bioregional rivalries. So a planetary scale awareness is also needed. So this is a question that would any of you like to answer it? Okay, I can take a first shot at it. I think it's not just with the, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it's not just the media. I think, of course, the media has an important role, but it's also all the other connections we've been talking about. Uh, between communities, between civil society, and so on. Uh, that has to create the atmosphere for firstly questioning or challenging the current nation state boundaries, and to do that in ways that are, uh, you know, not just seen as being subversive, because it is subversive, 
but also seen as being convincing. I mean, for instance, to argue that a river basin has to be looked at as one unit for governance and management, uh, one has to argue about the river, about the communities along the river, the aquatic flora and fauna, et cetera, and to show that this connection is so very important for uh, both for that life and for human communities living along the river. Um, so uh, by showing that and then putting it in the media and in school education and so on and so forth, one is able to create at least a question in people's mind saying, does the India-Bangladesh border really make sense? Does the India-Pakistan border really make sense? Does it make sense to divide up the Tibetan and the Ladakh plateaus, which are one large ecosystem by the India-Chinese border, etc.? Now, of course, when I say these sorts of things, I can also be called anti-national, uh, but that's okay. I mean, I'm just, I mean, I'm stating what I think I, I, needs to happen. Now, um, I totally agree with you that if we were to say then, okay, the Ganga Basin starts competing with the Indus Basin, which starts competing with the Brahmaputra Basin, et cetera, then that doesn't really solve the problem. But if we put all the different principles that I was speaking about earlier, uh, and those five spheres of action uh, uh, together as a comprehensive way of looking at things, a comprehensive way of acting, then that won't happen. Because we will see that there's an interconnectedness between the Indus Basin and the Brahmaputra Basin and the Ganga uh, Basin. The earth as a whole, I think what's what you also pointed to, is so integrally, connect, integrally connected um, um, in all sorts of different ways. The, the rain that falls emerges from the sea and, and falls and then goes back into the sea via rivers. That makes an incredible hydrological connection. And I'm saying hydrological, it sounds funny, but let's say a, a water connection, a jal connection. Yeah? The same thing with the earth, the same thing with species. Birds are flying back and forth over thousands of kilometers and creating, uh, recreating forests. So it's really the ability to see that kind of interconnectedness, to see the reciprocity to see the interdependence that will hopefully not create new kinds of eco-regional boundaries that will start competing with each other. Um, but we have to first of all question the current political boundaries. Uh, and that's a difficult task, but let's at least start somewhere. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ashish ji. Would Asim ji, do, would you like to add to that? Middle, can you repeat the precise question once more? Because I yeah, missed the yeah, the question is, can Alton, just a second, I will have to look for the question to repeat it again. Um, yeah, the question was if alternative media can uh, help generate a sense of bioregionalism among people of a bioregion, and that we can, cannot afford to fall into the trap of replacing nation state rivalries with bioregional rivalries. But uh, that's the question. Right. Well, I think, yes, absolutely. I think that uh, community radio and local forms of communication, regional forms of communication because of linguistic affinities and so on are extremely important in terms of bringing people back to their roots and giving them more confidence uh, culturally in their uh, inheritance, in their ways of life and belief and thought and livelihood. None of these things can be accepted uncritically, but overall, given the assault there has been on multiple traditions quite indiscriminately around the world, I think this is very, very important. It's the first order of business is to actually resurrect the cultural confidence of communities which live close to the earth, who can't live without contact with the earth and so on. And in that, I think community radio and local regional forms of communication are very important. Now, uh, there's one important thing which needs to be distinguished. Whenever you talk about the local, uh, people will say there's no such thing as a self-sufficient village. You constantly have to trade and rely on things outside and so on. And I think that there's a difference between a self-sufficient village and a self-sufficient region. And when you talk about bioregionalism, then you are thinking of a large cluster of villages, often along a river basin, as Ashish was just describing, or along the coastline, but some significant region. And I think that you can have very interesting arrangements for uh, you know, uh, economic uh, affairs, as well as for ecological uh, you know, disputes and so on. You can come up with very interesting arrangements provided that local communication is valued. And for that, you do need these community radios and local transmission of cultural information 
otherwise what happens is you have the world information order in which the global systems uh, i.e rupert murdoch controlling maybe i don't know six trillion words a day or something like that uh, they would determine what people will be fed so the only way you can counteract it is with local action and local radio and i've seen it happen in parts of the western world i think uh, it's happening in parts of india as well so yes that's my short response to it all right thank you speakers uh, i think only one question has is left unanswered which is that the corporate world is on the other side of the sustainability divide and is there an ngo that is working towards that towards bringing them also including them i think that's the question uh, i asim okay if i go first yeah yeah please yeah i, I think there's two parts to that question one is in so far as you might either believe in the corporate world that is the capitalist corporate world uh, or say that well they're they're there right now so we have to deal with them uh, there are many things that people have attempted i mean for instance i know that greenpeace india targeted all the it companies to say why are you using fossil fuels in your uh, cell phone towers or in your operations whatever and at least one or two it companies did actually respond to say to that and say we're going to convert everything into solar so that's like saying okay there's reforms that are possible within the current uh, corporate structure and the same thing with within the state structure and we have to keep fighting for that of course but at the same time i would say we have to fundamentally ask the question of should the capitalist corporate world exist in the first place why cannot not all businesses be run by communities and collectives i mean for instance producer companies are doing that with with regard to a lot of things uh elango rangaswami shown in his village in kotambakkam that local communities can do small their own manufacturing processes retail can be run by collectives and cooperatives everything that a currently private big corporate sector is doing can be done in more uh economic democratic ways i am not saying the state taking over that's a whole separate issue i'm saying uh collectives being able to actually run these thing and and of course then also questioning what kind of production systems do we really need what kind of production systems are justified and viable and sustainable to give you a simple example from uh, from greece there was a uh, chemical detergent factory that was being run by a multinational corporation they declared bankruptcy and wanted to shut the whole thing down the workers of that factory took it over run it completely democratically they have a big sign on the board on their uh, factory saying we have no boss everybody gets paid exactly the same amount of money for every hour of work and they've switched from chemical detergents to olive oil based cleaning agents which are ecologically friendly that can happen across the entire production system as far as i'm concerned so i think in the long run we have to also question whether we in fact need the corporations at all okay thank you ashish ji uh all right so then that's the end of the questions i will just uh, read out a comment that has uh, been flagged uh, and uh, i think those who are not even, those who those who are not seeing the chat box should also uh, just uh, see this so roshni kutti has said that uh, over emphasizing the local i fear is that certain prejudices prevalent at the local level may not be neutralized for example attempts to bring social justice to dalits encouraging women to have more say in decision making these ideas and practices from the extra local helps to balance out injustices within communities and just flagging this even as i acknowledge that it's a balance we are striving at so do any of you want to comment on that or i do but i seem to go first well of course i mean yes uh, uh you know no tradition is perfect and there are all sorts of problems and there are all sorts of issues but i still maintain that even a bad community is better than no community uh it's a long discussion but i think that what social media is doing now in terms of a frontal assault on the idea of society as a whole uh, is a pretty deadly thing uh it's like i said a long discussion but i think one needs to first bring back the idea of a community in the first place and without having that idea resurrected properly i think all our efforts are going to be tantamount to not very much 
just to add to that, I think it's important to look at all those five spheres of uh, transformation together. When we say localization of political decision making, localization of economy, etc., we also at the same time have to emphasize the social justice, equality, and all those uh, goals and and struggles. And the three have to, and along with culture and ecology, as I mentioned, they all have to go together. Otherwise, we will face the sort of distortions you're talking about. But a second quick point to Roshni and everybody else, um, the local is everywhere. We are also local somewhere. And so if we have the right or the ability to question, let's say gender injustice in a local community in some village, let's give them the right to come into our houses and question our local. Let's give them the right to say, okay, we can come to your house and say, why the hell do you have so many gadgets in your house? which have come from mining in our region? Or why does your own community in the, uh, you know, why do you not even know your neighbor? Do you know your neighbor's name? You don't. What sense of community do you have? So let's do that questioning in a mutually respectful way in all sorts of directions and not simply think of the problems in local communities being there in villages or in small towns or in poor colonies of cities. It's also with us as middle class, upper middle class, kind of people. All right, so that was a great answer. Um, and I think uh, that's we have closed the questions now. So all that remains is that I will thank you guys. I mean, Kamladi asked me not to thank you, but I will thank you both for your time and efforts. And now I will pass it to Kamladi for some, for closing the session. Please, Kamladi. Yeah. So I think uh, Vikalp Sangam and Sangat we'll see how we get your book authored by both of you to many people in our network, how we make it more South Asian, that those are two concrete tasks which I see. And once again, I'm reminded of a little story. About 30 years ago, in the Himalayas, I asked a farmer, what does development mean for you? Vikas ka matlab kya hai aapke liye? To unho ne thoda socha, he thought for a while and he said, for me, development means greening of the heart. Monkey haryali. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that answer. Monkey haryali hai vikas. So I wish all of us that may our hearts be green ecologically and not with envy. And may our path be ecological, green, and loving. And I've been thinking for the last many weeks that maybe we should stop calling ourselves human beings. Let's start calling ourselves earth beings. There are earthworms, and then there are earth beings children of Mother Earth, part of Mother Earth, and as COVID-19 has shown us, pretty much like Earth bloody worms, no more and no less. So maybe with this kind of an understanding of our place and our role, like the earthworm, let's churn the Earth, making, make it more productive, and let's continue. I think the, the crisis is global and our responses will have to be local and global and particularly regional South Asian. So we'll carry this forward. And I really also want to celebrate my young team. Yes. Minal, I hand Unmuted. it over to you again, please. You cannot start again, they're showing. The host no, no, they, they don't want your voice to disturb. Sorry. Okay, Meena. Yeah. Meena? Yes, Kamladi. Go will, ahead. You say, will you say Khuda Hafiz to everybody? Yes, of course, I will say Khuda Hafiz to everybody. <laughs> Why is that a question? Hello? Uh, Kamladi, you're not 
No, no, go. Go ahead, Meenal. I've All finished. Right. I've concluded. Oh, okay, okay. All right then. So goodbye, everybody. And uh, we, the a recording of this session will be available on our Facebook page, like I said. And we will also send out a recording to everybody who has registered and uh, to all our network. And if you're not on our network, if you're not on any of our mailing list, you can leave your, you can write to us at sangat.sangat at jagori.org if you want to receive a recording. And thank you again for being such active participants. Thank you to such patient speakers. They've answered all your questions. So that's great. And bye and khuda hafiz. Thank you, Meenal. Meenal, can you also save the chat uh, as a file and send it? Yeah, I can do that. I can try to do that. We usually don't do that, but if you want it, then we can do that. Yeah, there's a there's a save uh, function on. I know, it. I know, but uh, it also saves people's private chats. Ah, okay. Well, yeah. no, this is just to be able to remember the question. All right, okay, I will do that. Yeah. I won't share it with anybody else. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, but he has muted. The guy who's organized this. Other there'll be constant correct, Bob, because there'll other be constant disturbances. If there are 40 people listening, you'll go on hearing their voices while the talk is going on. Even for uh, Amma's thing. But you, but you know,